Over the decades, we have seen the rise and fall of several trends in horror, and it's rare to see a single filmmaker at the forefront for more than one of those booms that takes over Hollywood and drives people to theaters wanting more. Aussie filmmaker James Wan burst onto the scene in 2004 with Saw, kicking off the torture porn era, which elevated violence and gore to new heights in the genre. But despite the success of the Saw films, it left him with a stigma for only getting over because of the violence in those films. And after two box office bombs following Saw, studios became hesitant to work with him. After a near three year hiatus, Juan returned to horror to prove that he was more than a director in the splat pack. Insidious released in 2010, six years after Soar, and it was the launching pad for the resurgence of paranormal horror, which was only cemented with his follow-up, The Conjuring, three years later. James Wan is the only horror director to have two franchises in the top 10 highest grossing horror franchises of all time, and he is on the verge of having a third franchise enter the top 10 with the release of Insidious The Red Door, a feat not accomplished by Carpenter, Craven, or King. Here are five James Wan films that slipped under the radar that you may not have We're probably heard of. In the first of two James Wan produced films on the list, both star Maria Bello. Demonic also stars Frank Grillo, who plays a detective investigating a five-person homicide at an abandoned home that was the scene of a massacre decades prior. Demonic blends in elements of shaky cam with steady cam as we see a group of 20-something ghost hunters head to the abandoned house to conduct an investigation and hold a seance to prove that ghosts are real. The film follows two stories. The first is with Grillo's character, Detective Mark Lewis, who's on scene and trying to unravel the case with John, who appears to be the only survivor at the scene. The second is with John, who joins his pregnant girlfriend and her team of ghost hunters led by her ex-boyfriend, where we, the viewer, get to see what happened play out through their cameras set up inside the home for the investigation. Lewis soon discovers that John's girlfriend is missing and knowing the history of the house being tied to satanic rituals, calls in psychologist Dr. Elizabeth Klein, played by Bello, to the scene to help interrogate John and get him to remember what happened that night and find out his involvement. The clock is ticking, and as the police begin to uncover the details of what happened, as the entity begins to make its present known, revealing how they all might be pawns in its game. Four. Having taken a break from horror to direct Aquaman, James Wan returned to horror with Malignant. Having yet another blockbuster under his name, Wan was given the freedom to do something original because he didn't want to remake an existing IP or do a sequel to any of his movies. He wanted to do something that harked back to the horror movies that he loved growing up in the 80s. Malignant is a supernatural esque slasher film with Madison Mitchell who begins to suffer from a series of visions that cause her paralysis and while she suffers through watching a series of grisly murders that they turn out to take place at the same time that she is seeing them. The film is unhinged, fun, and a breath of fresh air in the slasher genre with an ending that you will not see coming. Juan wanted to create a love letter to the films that he grew up on and achieved it. Malignant has solid kills, a mix of likable and dislikable characters, and it blends in some comedic moments flawlessly. Saying anything more about the film leads us into spoiler territory, so if you're expecting another James Wan ghost movie, then be prepared to be disappointed because it is a lot more than that. Number 3. 
Dead Silence was James Wan's first attempt to break away from the stigma of the Splat Pack and Saw. It barely broke even at the box office and was a critical failure. It has remained a divisive film in the genre, but over time it has found a cult following. The film stars Ryan Quantin of True Blood fame as Jamie Ashen. He returns home one night to discover his wife's body propped under the couple's white bedsheet like a puppet. Her face a death mask of utter terror. He believes her death may be tied to the mysterious present they received only days before, a ventriloquist dummy named Billy. Ashen heads to his hometown to investigate the legend of Mary Shaw, a ventriloquist who punished misbehaving children, only he begins to uncover something more while becoming the focus of his wife's death. Dead Silence is aesthetically pleasing and it is a great callback to horror films of the black and white era. Not only do we get the introduction of another creepy doll in the horror genre, Juan introduces us to another scary female antagonist in Mary Shaw. Number two. James Wan is one of the producers and influences for David F. Sandberg's Lights Out, a film that started out as a short film entry into a contest that didn't win but went viral, attracting the attention of agents and James Wan himself. Lights Out is one of the rare horror films that we saw in theaters where people were screaming in terror during some of the film's scariest scenes. Having made $148 million on a $4.9 million budget, it is one of the best horror films of 2016. Lights Out is about Rebecca, played by Teresa Palmer, who left her younger brother Martin behind with her mentally unstable mother Sophie, played by Maria Bella. Sophie's illness stems from a sinister entity that has clung to her since her childhood and only appears in the shadows to torment her or anyone in her life. The presence of the entity has made it difficult for her son, Martin, to even sleep at night, causing him to often fall asleep at school and get in trouble for it. The school looks to address his behavior but is unable to get a hold of Sophie, so they call Rebecca. Seeing what Martin's going through, Rebecca debates whether or not if Martin living with her mother is the best thing for him and confronts her on it. But this causes the entity haunting Sophie to target Rebecca as a warning to stay away. Number one. Death Sentence was Juan's second directorial film in 2007 and his second film, Bust, only grossing $17 million at the box office on a $20 million budget. Unlike his previous films, Death Sentence, starring Kevin Bacon, was a revenge film and it was ahead of its time. Coming out prior to Taken, which launched the middle-aged vigilante films into the stratosphere. The film was adapted from the sequel novel to 1972's Death Wish, which some may know was adapted into film two years later with Charles Bronson. Death Sentence is a gritty 70s style flick that follows father Nick Hume seeking revenge for the murder of his son by a gang member who cuts a deal for a lighter sentence. Hume decides to take matters into his own hands and kills the gangbanger, which kicks off a war between him and the remaining members of the gang. Like some of the films that came after it, Death Sentence features satisfying kills like we get in Taken and John Wick. But the one major difference between this film and the others is that you don't get that sense that by the climax of the film that our protagonist will survive. Kevin Bacon's performance, as expected, is gripping and tugs at the heartstrings as you feel his pain and rage throughout the film. I didn't think about it until I was writing up this list, but you really think about James Wan with Saw kicking off the whole mm -hmm. torture point thing, and then, sure, there was paranormal activity out there, but once Insidious dropped, people went nuts for paranormal films. Mm -hmm. Death Sentence is probably really the catalyst for all the middle-aged men or men past their prime kicking people's asses because it's all about revenge. Mm -hmm. It came out before Taken. It flopped, which I don't know why. It was just a really good movie. And it's got Kevin Bacon. Man. Kevin Bacon delivers. He really does. I Oh my God. I think so many people are like, they're always like, oh, he's that guy that got the arrow through the throat on Friday the 13th. Or he's the guy who danced, you know, in Footloose. That is not all there is to Kevin Bacon. He is 
really an incredible actor. Mm -hmm. We watched his TV show The Following, which sadly only aired for three seasons, which sucks. It was amazing. He was amazing. He made us wanting more every single week. I think he, even though he is a big actor, he's highly underrated. Yeah, I... People don't know his range. With the list that we talked about when it came to Stephen King films, I explained why I hate the man that now shall not be named. But Kevin Bacon played in similar roles in Sleepers and then in The Woodsman, where he was an absolute vile human being and my god you will hate him in those roles but I just I've seen him in so many things over the years I just can't walk away and say yeah I am now forever tainted with this guy and I'm never gonna like him again he's just brilliant and he, that, so was the movie yeah. he is absolutely brilliant and this movie was so good now we only watched it like one time which kind of we really should revisit it because mm -hmm. it really is a good film and it does tug at your heartstrings because you can feel you know I mean, he's a dad in real life so i think he brings that to the film and you can feel his rage and his you know his pain and when you see that sort of thing in a movie and you can feel it from the actor that's that is damn good acting mm -hmm. so yeah you should watch it if you haven't yes and then lights out my god oh my god that movie i was not one of the people like screaming in the movie theater that was that was pretty entertaining but i definitely jumped a lot because there i mean there's just a real you know because it's lights out right so a lot of it takes place in the dark so then when the lights come on and something's just in your face <laughs> it's one of those movies like smile and barbarian from yeah. last year where mm -hmm. you don't expect much from it and then when you get it, it's like wow yeah. this is actually really good yeah and it's one of those ones too where you know a lot you know a portion of the film takes place at Rebecca's apartment so when the lights are out you're kind of only getting the flicker right she lives in the city she's just getting the flickering from the business lights like uh -huh. that are on the other side of her apartment so good lighting. Uh -huh. it really is and it's creepy as hell right so you're like it's dark and it's like oh shit what's going to be there when it lights up and it's not a bright light so you just kind of see like a little bit of it i definitely recommend this movie and you wouldn't believe the amount of people that never even heard of it yeah even check out the the short story too that's that's even creepier than what the film was yeah then of course you got dead silence introduction of another creepy little ass doll puppet yeah what do you think about that against annabelle or annabelle comes home or annabelle creation mm -hmm. it's about the same and the only like reason it's number three is because she didn't like malignant and I will get her to watch it one day, and she will change her mind like I she won't. has done on several horror films, people. The Thing is one of them that she but changed But not her mind Malignant, on. because Malignant I had figured out before I went to see the movie because I know what Malignant means. They advertised the movie as a ghost movie, and it's not. It's a slasher film. Completely original idea. That transformed but I the knew, ending But I Terror knew it II. wasn't going to be a, a paranormal. I knew it wasn't a ghost movie. We all know what malignant means, besides this one. Malignant was good. Oh my god, he didn't know what malignant meant! The movie was good. Good for you, I did not like it. And Demonica, our number five pick, I swear we've watched it before. We came back to it. We it definitely did watch good. it before. I think maybe it was one of those ones. I don't know. Maybe we like had a few drinks and we weren't really paying much attention. Could be one of those deals. I'm thinking it might be. Uh -huh. Especially if we watch it at any time during lockdown. Maybe. Because we may have. That may have. I, I want to say that it was like semi recent. So it may have been during lockdown. And if you get your hands on alcohol during lockdown, that's what you were doing. <laughs> So yeah. I feel like that's when we watch it and we probably just don't really remember it. It was a pretty good movie. It's got a skinny Frank Grillo in it. Yeah, a little strange to see that. Mm -hmm. And he's not fat. No, but no, no, he no. is skinny in this. But normally he's like a little more like mm -hmm. buff, right? Like he's he's got a little more like muscle going on. Maria Bello, she's amazing. She's not just like, you know, Kevin James's wife in grown ups. <laughs> She's so much more than that, and she has so much more, like, depth. How about this? Maria Bello and horror films. So we're talking about two here. We talked about Secret Window yeah. and the Stephen King one. So she kind of nails it when it comes to those. 
Yeah, I think uh, I think that's kind of like her niche. I think she's really good in like those films. Mm -hmm. Not that she isn't good in like, you know, Grown Ups for the part that she was meant to play, no. but you don't see her range in a film like that. I like seeing her actually express emotion and, and feelings and dramatic mm -hmm. roles, and she brings her dramatic prowess into horror films, and it's a great compliment. It mm -hmm. just fits perfect, and you believe her. Mm -hmm. What? films would be on your top five of James Wan films. You know? Yeah, maybe we haven't seen them and we should check them out. I don't know. There's one that he's made that nobody can find. It's his uh, first film ever made and it's not being released to the public. That's so. not fair. No, not fair at all. What the hell, James Wan? <laughs> so it's bad. You got a whole bunch of good stuff. You are the only director that can say, look, man, I got a franchise. Not one. Two franchises yeah. in the top ten money making of all time, and you're probably gonna have a third one with Insidious. It won't stay there long, but still. Because horror movies never do, but it doesn't mean that it's not gonna make money. I think it's gonna be amazing. The poster is really fucking cool. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. really, really like that poster. Honestly, I think Stephen King's It should not be in the top ten. It's only two movies. It's not really a franchise. It was a part one and part two. Take that out of there. Well, and let's put it this way. First of all, it was a TV miniseries uh -huh. is how it was billed to begin with, uh -huh. which is how most of his movies were. They it, were TV miniseries. I think, honestly, everybody, what do you think? Franchise should be more than two. I think it has to be at least three. At it, least has three. To, it starts at three. I think that's when a franchise starts. And really, isn't that what Mindy said, right? Like, in Scream... Uh, no, two, two was a sequel, but three is a franchise. No, three is a trilogy, and more than three is a franchise. Okay, well, I'm going to go with three as a franchise. Yeah, I can go with that, too. I, I think so. Anyway, don't forget to... Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Watch videos, win stuff, and until the next Pop 5, see, see ya. ya.